the Financial Survival Network. Now more than ever. And welcome. You are listening to Watching the Financial Survival Network. It's Monday, September 19th. Uh, person you're about to hear from, I think this is one of our most important interviews that you're going to hear. In addition to being a novelist, uh, John, and his name's John D. Kuhns, uh, extensive, extensive experience uh, working overseas, uh, investment banking, electric power production, uh, venture cap uh, in China. Um, John, you uh, you handled uh, a lot of uh, power projects, dams, hydroelectric projects. You founded China Hydroelectric Corporation. You acquired 27 hydroelectric stations. I mean, you know what's going on in the PRC, the People's Republic of China. Uh, where they're at now, can you give us some insight into uh, where the country really is as opposed to what you read about in the papers? Sure, Kerry. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's good to be with you. Um, yeah, I think personally, uh, I mean, this could be a little optimistic. I'll, I'll tell you why I use the word optimistic in a minute. But I think China's probably right at its peak. Uh, I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, but I, I mean, as as a as a commercial enterprise, as potentially a, I'm not saying it's peak in terms of a threat to the United States, but it's peak of, of kind of uh, long distance escalation from their really uh, early beginnings. That's because of uh, really three things. Number, number one, uh, the demographic trends in China are gonna catch up with them. Some demographers say their population has already started to diminish, which is significant for China because they depend on that huge population uh, for a lot of things. S second of all, uh, I think Xi Jinping's COVID, uh, you know, no COVID policy has really slowed the country down. And together with the dem demographic trends, I, I think it could be too much of a hump to overcome. I think the last thing is most economists estimate that uh, the fraud that's pervasive in the corrupt China system takes about 20% of the cash out of the system annually. That, that's not sustainable. So those three things give me the feeling that China could be peaking as a, let's say, commercial enterprise. Okay, so infrastructure-wise, uh, I've been reading about and I've done some some videos about the Three Gorges Dam, and it appears that there's a lot of issues with it. It's a, a strategic risk. Recently, Taiwan said, "Hey, we got lots of missiles. We can reach Beijing, and we can reach the Three Gorges Dam, which uh, up until recently was the largest." hydroelectric dam in the world. Uh, it seems there's quality issues. There's a thing called thermal cracking. You're an expert on this. You built and operated hydroelectric plants. You know the, the issues with dams of any size, really. But everything, uh, all the risks that are present in a smaller dam are really uh, go up geometrically on a mega dam, like Three Gorges. What's your take on the situation there? Well, um, if you're going to do business in China effectively, Kerry, you've got to be partners with a princeling that is a descendant of the uh, the Long March families and, and leaders. Uh, I was, I'm not going to use his name here, but his father was the first minister of electricity under uh, Chairman Mao when he uh, started the PRC in 1949. Uh, we had to get approvals from the Ministry of Electricity for the 27 hydro stations that we 
developed and operated, and the ongoing, uh, never to be discussed topic at the Ministry of Electricity was the fact that uh, they felt that this, the Three Gorges Dam caused the Sichuan earthquakes, which took place right around 2008, right around the Olympics. Why? Because it's a very low, flat, but huge reservoir that sits over a bunch of fragile earth. And so, so in terms of the Three Gorges Dam, uh, there, there's a lot of places to start, but that's where I start. I mean, the, they were advised not to build it. They, well, of course, we're going to go ahead and do it anyway, just like they're going to make a grab for Taiwan sooner or later. But I think the Three Gorges plan, yeah, I mean, you blow that thing up and you got a lot of people downstream, literally tens of millions. Yeah, and, and uh, there's quality issues, cracking, um, supposedly. There's shiny. quality issues, carry all over China. Any <laughs> infrastructure you thought, look, I mean, here, here's what happens when you build a hydroelectric project. You're supposed to have quality control supervisors taking your batch tests like, right. like, like daily, okay? Th th those guys get paid off. We, we had to get rid of the fraudsters and bring our own QC in because otherwise we were going to have the same problems. There's quality problems all over China. And there you got these uh, so-called tofu dreck buildings. They kind of like look like uh, styrofoam yeah. exteriors. Right. And they're, they're just falling apart before anybody even moves in there. And then yeah. it seems to be a Chinese, you know, maintenance is tough. Maintaining physical plants tough in the U.S., but we've managed to do it for a long time in the Western world. But in uh, China, they, they seem to have no interest in doing rudimentary basic maintenance that winds up... Uh, causing all sorts of problems and failures, et cetera. That, that's really not part of their equation. I mean, their, their equation is get it built, get it up, show the world how nice and shiny it looks, and don't care about what you just said that has to be installed in the infrastructure if it's going to last a long time. It's not part of their, uh, their, their dictionary. Uh, I remember when I was there, First time 25 years ago, they were in the midst of their highway building boom. And basically, they pretty much knocked off the U.S. interstate highway system right down to the colors of the signs because they f said, well, the system is the best in the world. But they were like the concrete was wavy. And n when I went back 20 years later, definitely was improvements in their highway building for sure. Uh, but... You know, getting back to the dam, uh, so you have no confidence in the quality control that went into that dam, and you know from firsthand experience what uh, QC is on the ground, boots on the ground there. Yeah, I, I don't have any confidence in the Chinese quality control system, period. Right. So It's corrupt. So it's very, so we got... Earthquake faults, two earthquake faults that the uh, dam is built on. Uh, we've got questionable uh, concrete quality. We see cracking there and now thermal cracking, which coming is coming from the heat. And then we've got a drought, which actually seems to me, now correct me if I'm wrong, is actually bad for a dam when the, when the level gets too low. Uh, it can actually have... A worse effect on the dam than if you have it filled up to the top. Is that correct? Um, I, I, I'm no expert on that stuff, Gary. Mm -hmm. Okay. But there's definitely issues. And of course, they don't want any of it to get out, do they? No, no. I mean, that's again part of the dictionary. No, no word gets out. Yeah. No, no loss of face. It's all about saving face, right? right? That's the Asian that's way. Cool. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. you're in the Solomon Islands now. Do I have that right? Yes, I'm on uh, Bougainville, which is an archipelago within the Solomon's archipelago. We are the largest island in the Solomon's, but we're not part of the political entity, the Solomon Islands. Uh, we're part of Papua New Guinea until uh, three years from now when we become independent.
I see. So what's going on in the Solomon Islands, though? Uh, they recently turned back a, a U.S. Coast Guard ship from docking there? Uh, yes, they current turned back actually two Coast Guard vessels and a British vessel. I think it's HMS Spey, S-P-E-Y. And you're going to see that continue because the prime minister there has been bought off. Uh, not the entire government, but the prime minister for sure. That's been going on for years and since, since he was elected a couple of years ago. And basically the Solomon Islands until that guy is cleaned out of office, is over as, as a member of, let's say, uh, the democratic world. All right. And, and, and pretty much uh, the U.S. has said that's a red line if uh, China starts building a military base there. That's it? Well, do you believe that, Kerry? <laughs> you no, know, I mean, no. look, yeah. <laughs> I, let, 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 let me answer you this way. If you were to ask me what went wrong there, it's because the, not just the United States, but more importantly, Australia, which is, which is any time I talk to my friends in the United States about helping Bougainville, which uh, hopefully we can get to, Sure. Uh, they say, well, look, it's Australia's backyard, so we really have to defer to them. And Australia has treated the Solomon Islands like for years as, as an afterthought, and they're, they're getting what's coming to them for doing that. You, you know, you can't, you can't have blissful democracy until you work at it and pay for it. And Australia dropped the ball, and of course, the United States hasn't been heard from here in 20 years. Oh, unbelievable. Well, so Bougainville, tell us about the efforts there to save where you are. Well, the thing is that we have a much more tantalizing prize carry in Bougainville than the Solomon Islands have, which the Solomon Islands are essentially an agricultural economy with no real resources and, and they're broke. We have the Panguna Mine. When it operated from 1972 to 1989, it was owned and operated by Rio Tinto. It yep. was the largest copper and gold mine in the world. If it was rejuvenated today, it, it shut down due to a civil war called the crisis that was started by the mine in 1989. If it was rejuvenated today, it would be one of the top 10, again, copper and gold resources in the world. The ore in the mine is estimated by geologists to be worth approximately $100 billion, not million, billion dollars today. And the rest of the island is also highly prospective. There's probably two or three other Panguna mines on the island. So that's what the Chinese the want. The Chinese have tried to buy it. They've tried to get licenses to explore here. Nothing has worked, thankfully, because of one man in, a, in particular, Ishmael Torarama, who's the current president. But obviously, the Solomons is right across the waterway that the old armed forces guys called the slot. And we're paying close attention to what's happening there. Interesting. Yeah. Well, we all know the uh, history of mining there. Very rich. And uh, due to uh, local politics, uh, you know, these uh, these foreign assets are often very difficult to uh, to start to start the project in the first place. But once they've been stopped, uh, then it becomes a real nightmare because uh, it's a lot harder to st restart a project than it is to just start from scratch. A lot of times, uh, when they've been, I'm sure it's been neglected and not much care and maintenance uh, done on it. Well. Um... Let's put it this way. Uh, you are correct that the Panguna mine has a huge amount of e emotional baggage attached to it. it. It caused the crisis, which raged from 1989 to 2001, when Ishmael Torarama signed the Bougainville Peace Agreement. 20,000 people died here, 10% of the population as a result of the crisis. However, Gary, it's the key to Bougainville realizing a long dream that they've had 
since they became uh, close as a people, and that is to be independent. Uh, there was an independence referendum conducted by the UN in December of 2019. 98% of the registered Bougainvillians, about 90% of the adult population voted for independence. So they're going to be independent. And the key to that is restarting the mine. So yes, it's an issue, you're correct, but it's made Bougainvillians feel like a nation and, and that's going to continue until they're independent. And they can afford to be with that mine and their fishery resource. Oh, that's, that's good news. Well, we'll keep our fingers crossed. Tell us about your latest book, John, is they call me Ishmael. You, this is your fourth book. Uh, tell us a, a little bit about it. Uh, I guess it's somewhat uh, of a historic um, fictionalization of the history in uh, Papua New Guinea. Yeah, it, it, it's it's uh, all of my novels uh, feature a guy named uh, Jack Davis, and, and I write my novels from personal experience, and this is no different. The book is about Ishmael, uh, the aforementioned current president of the autonomous region of Bougainville, which is an autonomous region of Papua New Guinea. Uh, he was, before that, the leader of the guerrilla militia that uh, held off the PNG Defense Force in a civil war. He then uh, initiated the Bougainville Peace Agreement and ran for president in 2020 and was elected. He will be the first leader of Bougainville as an independent nation and the newest nation on earth. It's also essentially the story of Bougainville, which the people here deserve to uh, read and hear. There, there hasn't been a lot of literature on Bougainville because of the crisis. Okay. Well, it's, it sounds fascinating. I mean, I was watching a epi an episode of Gold Rush, and one of the guys there, this guy, uh, Parker Schnabel, who's like a young mine boss, who's done, I don't know where he's made more money, whether he's made money mining gold or just being a TV star. But in any event, he goes and he visits a mine, a gold mine, in Papua New Guinea, and uh, the poor people uh, who are risking life and limb to jump the fence, grab gold, uh, any amount, and then get back over without getting shot. It was quite disturbing, I have to say. And, you know, the mining industry's got more of an obligation here, especially the history of Papua New Guinea, they've got an obligation to help set things right for these people, for this country, emerging country. Yeah, Terry, uh, I, I agree. Look, I, I have friends who have been in security patrols in those Papua New Guinea mines, and what you describe happens there all the time. But please uh, be careful not to too closely affiliate Bougainville with the rest of Papua sure. New Guinea. They're, they're all Melanesians, but Bougainville is very different. You, you, will, you would never see Bougainvillians do what you just described, jumping the fence and so forth. Uh, they're really a very different people. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, they, they will be a big part of the redevelopment and ownership and management of this mine, it will be, thanks to Ishmael, a Bougainville deal, and hopefully it'll be an outlier in the mining world. It, it, can, it can afford to be. Uh, I hope it becomes an example, uh, because what I saw there was really disturbing, and it, I'm happy to hear that it's not happening in Bougainville, because yeah. you know, it just, I don't think the mining company entities uh, set out to do evil but uh, they're in an untenable situation due to the political issues taking place on those other islands. So uh, hopefully Bougainville can lead by example. In the book, they call me Ishmael. It's available on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and wherever fine books used to be sold. And uh, the website is John D. Coons, K-U-H-N-S, 
take a look at his site. And uh, hey, if you've got a question for John, shoot me an email, kl at kerryletz.com. I think the insider perspective of Chinese infrastructure that you've provided us, John, really, really helpful because it's hard to get that info uh, because you, you look at Three Gorges videos on, uh, on YouTube and, you know, it's just disinformation, you know, nothing yeah. believable. And there's no hard facts. You're somebody who was on the ground. So we really appreciate your, your furnishing us that info, your generosity with it and your honesty. And we'll definitely talk to you again. Like I said, if you've got a question for John, kl at kerrylutz.com. And make sure you go to the website, financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Sign up for the free newsletter. John, we'll talk to you again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kerry. Thanks. Anytime. Take care.